So number nine then from the 2018 SQA Advanced Higher Mathematics of Mechanics. Projectile motion for 10 marks in three parts here. A projectile is launched with a speed v at an angle of theta, so there's the initial velocity vector. Show that the horizontal range is given by this expression here for four marks. Now, in the marking scheme, that shows actually three methods for doing this, but there's really just one method and just different ways of setting out, which is basically this. It'll hit the ground when it runs out of time in the air. It's all about how long does it stay in the air. And for that, there's a couple of methods. You can either say that the time spent in the air is twice the time it takes to get to the top, because this is a symmetrical parabola, if there's no air resistance. Or the other way would be to get an equation for the height and say the time taken will be the time taken for the height to get back to zero. But in both cases, you're going to need the components of this velocity. So that'll be the first stage. There's the initial velocity. There's an x component and there's a y component to the velocity, but there's a difference between them. This x component I'm going to call vx because it's going to be constant. There's no change across the way. It's going to keep traveling with the same speed across the way. It's the vertical one that's going to change. So this vertical component of the initial velocity of this velocity here, I'm going to call u y, just to differentiate it, that that changes, that's just what it starts off at. So that means Vx being next to theta will be, there's the right angle triangle, will be V cos theta, and Uy will be V, whoops, sine theta. Now there's no marks for stating those explicitly. So the two techniques then. Find the time to the top and double it, or find the time it takes for the height to get to zero. We'll just do them both so you can compare them. So, time it takes to get to the top when the velocity is zero. Well, what's the velocity given by? The vertical velocity would be given by the initial velocity minus at. So that's minus g. v equals u plus at. So that means it's equal to v sine theta minus gt. Now, it's at the top. So y max means that v sine theta minus gt equals zero. So that you'll get the time for that just by taking that across and divide by g. v sine theta upon g. So that next, there's some marks to come down, but there's only two marks so far. Time of flight, I can use some other letter. That means that must equal two times that will be 2t. Didn't need to write that particularly. This is the important bit. It's 2v sine theta upon g. Now there's two marks for getting that time of flight there. One would have been from the equation here. Would be for this expression here for the velocity equal to zero. And the second one for getting the time of flight by doubling the resultant rearrangement. So what would the range be? Again, this 2t, I'll put a capital T there, just to give it that name, the time of the range. So how far did it get then? So now consider the x components of it. So the formula you'd be using here is just constant motion across zero acceleration. You'd be using s equals just ut. So the range will be vx times that time. So the range will be, now Vx is V cos theta, and the time taken was 2V sine theta upon G. I just gave that that name T, so that T wasn't confused with that T, because that was one of the problems of doing it this way. Now it's just a case of rearranging that. Well, that, you can see what you've got, but I think I'll put it down this way first of all. That's V squared upon G times 2 sine theta cos theta, that's the expansion of the sine of 2 theta. Now the marks come from saying that the range will be this velocity multiplied by the time. And the sec last mark was really for just tidying it up and well, explaining this double angle formula. 
Now, this part will be the same in both methods. The other way of finding the time of flight, again, it's to consider the vertical motion. Only this time, instead of finding the time to the top, you're finding the time for the distance to come to zero. This time you're going to be using this formula. S equals UT plus a half AT squared. Where that U would be the initial vertical velocity. Maybe I'll just put that in as a wee mention. And of course that S is the vertical distance. It'll have reached its range when it hits the ground, when the distance is zero. So I want that lot to be zero. So I've got V sine theta times T plus, or rather, minus, because the acceleration due to gravity is down the way, a half g t squared equals zero. I should have put it at the beginning. S equals zero means that. Now, that's one of the marks. Next part's just for solving it. You've got a quadratic here, but there's a common factor of t, so take the t out. So you've got t times v sine theta minus a half g t. That comes to zero. So if that product comes to zero, that either means that t equals zero, which it certainly will be at the start, or the content of the bracket, v sine theta minus a half g, t equals zero, which of course is pretty close to what you had in the first one, except with that half. Rearranging that means that t, the time for it to get down to zero would be, take that across, the 2 goes up and multiplies it, 2v sine theta upon g as before. Only this time that t is the time of flight, so that would be the t that's there. I was simply doing the velocity one when the velocity is zero, then you didn't have this quadratic thing to factorise. Part B, it's in two parts, part B, part one, for three marks. A tennis training device fire balls at the same speed each time, but the angle of projection can vary. So it's still this situation here. And it says this now, a ball fired at 30 degrees has got a range R. A ball fired at 35 degrees has got a slightly longer range, range of R plus five. We just put those two things down. So what have you got? So at 30 degrees, so v squared sine, and if it's at 30, double it will be 60, divided by g, that equals r. And the other one is, if it's fired at 35, so double it will be 70, that'll be r plus 5. Well, you've got a pair of simultaneous equations there then. But before you do your simultaneous equations, you're going to get a mark just for substituting those numbers into the formula. Right, there's two ways of doing that. You can either think, rearrange them both to read r equals, and then equate them, or you can just think, subtract them, whichever way around you like. I think I'll just call them that, one and two. And so if I do two take away one, I'll be left with, I'll have this minus that equals five. V squared sine 70 upon g minus this one, v squared sine 60 upon g, we well, call this minus this, which is 5. Now you can take out the common factors. So you've got v squared upon g times sine 70 minus sine 60. And then finally rearrange it to read v. Well, I'll just leave it as v squared. So it's going to be 5 times g divided by sine 70 minus sine 60. So it's just pop in the figures and there's your answer. Or maybe we'll just put the figures in right now. So V will be the square root of, I didn't need to do this part, 5 times 9.8 over the sine of 70 minus the sine of 60, where those are, of course are in degrees. And of course there was a mark for rearranging it to read V equals, or just V squared, because the final marks for the answer. And when you put that into your calculator, you get 25.7905 and so on, which of course has got far too many figures considering you just use 9.8 with two significant figures. But even so, turn a blind eye, I'm going to write 25.8 meters per second.
på The Final Bark. And the final part, B part 3 for 3 marks. On a particular day, the tennis balls are assisted by a horizontal tailwind of 7 metres per second. Find the new range of a ball which is fired at 35 degrees. Remember the speed was, we've already worked it out, 25.8. So it's going to be 35 degrees this time. Now again in the Martin scheme, it shows umpteen, four different methods of doing this. There's essentially just two one is to just start from scratch and work out the time taken and then add the extra part for the wind. The other way would be to find the resultant velocity of the ball and the wind and just use this formula here. That means recalculating the magnitude and the angle of the resultant velocity. The simplest way is probably just to, you've got this formula down already in the first part, find the time of flight from scratch and then work out the distance it would travel, adding on the velocity of the wind. So for this part, what would the time of flight be? So the time of flight is going to be, and you've already got this, 2v sine theta upon g. So that's 2 times 25.8 sine 35 upon 9.8 seconds. And when you put that in, you get the time of flight this time to be 3.02 seconds. There seems to be one mark for getting the time of flight. It's just a case of how you're going to proceed with that now. So you could either say this, use that formula to get the range for those values and then add on the extra distance using this time with the wind speed or just work out the new effective velocity across the way against that time, which would be the simpler one. So what we've got for Vx this time. So this time Vx is made up of two parts. It's made up of the horizontal component of that, which will be the 25.8 cos 35, plus the 7 for the wind. Now, I could just put that in a bracket and multiply by that and get the answer, but I'll get the answer to this because they've given a mark for this part. So that would give you 28.13, I'll put metres per second. So that's the new horizontal speed then, which means that the range is going to be that speed for that time. Vx times t. 28.13 times 3.02 metres. Now, Finding the new horizontal speed was one mark, which, and again, depends on how many figures you keep in this. 84.96, or 97 rounded off, but probably just call that 85.0. 85.0 metres for the final mark. Now, the other way of employing that time of flight would be to, instead of having just worked out the horizontal distance travelled by the ball and then the wind, we'd be able to use this equation for the range and then add on the portion for the wind, which you could have done that from, by doing this. So the total range would have been how far would it have gone on its own according to that formula. Add on to that the extra distance travelled by the wind. So V wind times this time of flight. Should give the same answer. Remember that V is going to be this, this formula worked for the velocity here. 25.8 squared sine double the angle is 70 upon 9.8 plus the wind was 7 and you worked out that it went for 3.02 seconds. So that total distance will be in metres. Again, even here you didn't need to use that formula. You could have gone really back to scratch and just worked out V plus UT equals 0. Anyway, typing that in should hopefully give the same answer as this. And of course it does. 84.966697, so 85.0 metres. But there wasn't really any point doing it that way. You could have done that way. Anyway, maybe you thought we'll have to use the result given in the first part. 
because this, you're using this formula twice in effect. Because remember that formula there incorporates already the time of flight within it. And that's what leads you to the real alternative method, because these methods are essentially the same. So, an alternative to that would be to just use this formula on the find the resultant velocity. So you've got these two velocities here. I think I'll put it down this way. So the resultant velocity. That'll be the initial velocity, that'll be the, vo the initial velocity here of the ball plus the velocity of the wind, which I'll just put W down as W. Let me put this in vector form here. X component, Y component. So the X component of this will be the cos. So that's going to be 25.8 cos 35. The Y component is going to be 25.8 sine 35. The wind component is 7, 0. So that means the final result will be 28.13 across the way and 14.798, so 14.80 up the way. Now that you've got the two components, you can reconstruct that these are the two parts I want for the formula. What's the magnitude and what's the angle? So what's the magnitude? V, that's going to be the square, it's actually quite long this way. That's going to be the square root of 28.13 squared plus 14.80 squared. And the angle is going to be the inverse tan. Remember the two components look like this. For the x and the y. And those are the parts that you know. You know that the x component is the 28.13 and the y component is 14.8. So it's inverse tan of 14.80 over 28.13. Then they'll be fed into this formula and give you the answer in one go. Now you could just feed them in the way it is, but I'll just work out these two answers. So that came to 31.785. Oh, we'll just keep it all in just now because it's not the final answer, so I'll just say 79 metres per second. And that comes to 27.75 degrees. Which means, finally, you can work out the range by putting it into this. You can see why you wouldn't bother doing it this way. So the range is going to be using that formula. 31.79 squared. So that was a bit daft. I should have left that as squared. So you'd be having to do that square root and then just square it back again. Times the sine of, I'm not going to bother, I'm just going to put 2 times 27.75 all divided by, and then for all that accuracy, you've just got a 9.8 with two significant figures here. Pop it in, and of course, there you go again, 84.99, so that's 85.0 metres once again. Except I don't think you would have bothered to do it that way. It might have looked more sort of rigorous, find the resultant vector and go through that, but it was far simpler just to get that time of flight again and just do the two horizontal components. If you did do it this way, the marks came in at one for the resultant speed, one for the resultant angle, and one for popping it into the formula.